Happy New Year to you. My name is Bill. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Spring Lake Church. It is great to get to worship together in the new year. Isn't this cool that we get to kick off the new year worshiping Jesus together? That's awesome. This week, as I was preparing this message and thinking about New Year's, I came across some fascinating statistics regarding New Year's resolutions. Okay, How many of you do New Year's resolutions, by the way? Raise your hand. Okay, like no one. Okay, no, there's like two people. We're, none of us are trying to better ourselves this year. No, I'm kidding. But did you know that actually only 38.5% of U.S. adults set New Year's resolutions yearly? Um, 52.6% focus on one New Year's resolution, whereas 47.4% set multiple ones. 59% of young adults ages 18 to 34 have New Year's resolutions, making them the largest demographic. And people over 55 are 3.1 times less likely to have a resolution than younger adults. And so it seems that the older that you become, the less likely you are to have a New Year's resolution. And I like this statistic as a parent, that parents, 54% of parents with children in the home have New Year's resolutions. I think for nearly every single one of those parents, it's probably something to do with sleeping, right? But it's fascinating. And I think the truth is, is even if you're not one of those people who has a New Year's resolution... Um, The new year is really a time for us to look at the year ahead and to decide, do we want to be different in any way? Even if it's not like I wrote my New Year's resolution out and I put it on my wall or whatever, we all kind of think about what's this year ahead going to look like? How are things going to be different? What things do I want to change? And I was listening to this podcast recently, and this guy was talking about him wanting to change. In fact, he was trying to overcome addiction in his life. And he said it wasn't until he was willing to start to view himself as basically killing his entire old self and begin building himself into a new, completely different person that things actually changed for him. I thought that was fascinating. Like he had to envision himself like kind of doing away with his old life and who he was and becoming a new person. And that concept, that in order to change, we have to become new people, is a lot like what we find in Scripture. That in fact, for Christ followers, belief in Jesus means that you and I give up who we were to become something new in Christ. That's kind of the vision that we get from Scripture. We leave behind something, and we become something entirely new. And as we launch New Year's together today... This is what I want to focus on as we talk about the newness that's available in Christ. In fact, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and we're going to discover the condition of newness, the means of newness, and the promise of newness. So if you have a Bible, you can open it to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, or you can, you know, go there on your phone. We also are on the Bible app, the Version Bible app. If you go there, um, you can actually find us in events and you can actually see the notes for the sermon today. So as you head there, as you head to 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm going to pray for us. Lord, um, we come to you, and we're so grateful first for those testimonies in our own church. Lord, it is amazing to see these people who have chosen to respond to you in obedience to be baptized. It is amazing to see your hand on their lives. It's cool to see transformation. It's cool to see people leave their old lives and embrace a new life in Christ. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we jump into this sermon and into your word, Lord, that you would open our eyes to your words, that you would help us to listen to your truth, that you would help us to change, to grow um, in 2023, to be more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That's a very popular Bible verse. We've heard that a ton. And so let's talk about the condition to newness first. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now, we're going to talk about that word if in just a moment that there is actually a condition to our newness. But first, 
we have to establish a little bit of context. I've said this many times before, but whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, it's there for a reason. And it should always cause you, when you open up to a passage and you're starting there, it should always cause you to look back to the verses behind that or before that and to get the context that we're talking about. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 16, not 17, but 16 says this. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And so what Paul is talking about here is the difference between how the world thinks and how the world um, looks at things and even how the world looks at Christ and how we should look at others now and, uh, and Christ now, now that we're in Christ. Because the world, what it does is when it looks at people, it looks at people's external measures. In fact, if you're if you're talking about this passage and you're actually thinking about it in the context of 2 Corinthians, Paul is teaching the church in Corinth about not looking at externals, not looking at people the world's way of looking at people. Because the world judges people by pitting them against each other. The world looks at those who are slaves versus those who are free, men versus women, rich versus poor, in their context, circumcised versus uncircumcised, religiously outward versus just religious, right? And they were pitting people against each other. And Paul says before salvation, this is even how he viewed Jesus. He viewed Jesus the, world, the way the world looks at Jesus. Before Paul knew Jesus as the risen king, he had judged him as a false prophet. And he actually went around persecuting Christians for believing and following this Jesus. And so he's saying, my view of Jesus even used to be this worldly way. But what Paul is saying now is that we know Jesus. We don't think this way about people anymore. And we don't think this way about Jesus anymore. And so when you connect that to our verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17, what you see Paul saying is, we don't view other people like that anymore. And so therefore, I'm going to tell you how to look at all people, including yourself. If you are in Christ, this is how you should view yourself and others who are in Christ. And then he says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Paul is describing the spiritual reality of all of us who are in Christ. We are to view ourselves and to view other brothers and sisters sitting around us as new creations. That's how we should view ourselves and how we should view others. So that's the context. But let's talk about this word if. The word if means that there's a condition that needs to be met in order for us to have this spiritual reality of newness. It's not just that Jesus came and now every religious person is completely changed. That's not how this is working. The condition that Paul gives for you, for you to have this newness is to be in Christ. You must be in Christ. And I want to be really clear about this because Paul doesn't say, hey, if you go to church. Paul doesn't say, if you read your Bible. He doesn't say, if you listen to Christian music. He doesn't say, if you have the little Jesus bumper sticker thing on your car, right? He doesn't say if you wear the little gold or silver cross necklace. He doesn't say any of these other things, if you're a good person or if you give to charity or any other external condition. He says, if anyone is in Christ, you must be in Christ. It's like the resolution to get healthy, the New Year's resolution to get healthy, which by the way, I researched this this week, all about resolutions. That's the most popular thing by far. People always put, I want to get more healthy in some way. And so if you think about that, imagine measuring your overall health success by having a gym membership. Like that's your only indication of whether you're successful or not. Maybe you don't go or you go infrequently or when you do go, you just watch other people work out, right? That's kind of creepy. But you believe you're successful because you're doing this external thing that other people who are healthy are also doing, which is having a gym membership. We would look at a person like that and we would say, they're fooling themselves, right? 
They haven't gotten any healthier just by having a gym membership. It's the same thing that Paul is saying. The world's way of looking at things would be to say that you've done this, or you've done that, or you have a position of importance, or you're well-liked, or you have a membership, or whatever the external condition is, when the actual condition you must meet is not all these external things, but it's that you are in Christ. This is the criteria for newness. It's a relationship with Jesus. Now, you might ask, okay, so what does that look like? What does that mean to have a relationship with Jesus? Well, it's an excellent question. Romans 10, 9 and 10 gives us clear indication of this. It says this, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you p- profess your faith and are saved. And so the starting f- point for being in Christ is for us to truthfully declare with our mouths, with our own words, that Jesus really is Lord. Have you said that in your life? Jesus is Lord of your life. And you must believe in your heart that Jesus was resurrected, that he conquered sin and death. It's simply trusting Jesus actually is who he said he is that he is the savior of the world, that he is the risen king, that he set out what he accomplished to do, that Jesus took all of our sins on the cross, that he paid our penalty for sin and death, but he didn't stay dead. That actually Jesus conquered death so that we could have newness in him, newness of life in Christ. It's actually the same picture we get in baptism. Do you ever think about what baptism symbolizes? A lot of people think about it's just like a religious rite that people do. But when you look at the picture of baptism, when the person being baptized goes under the water, it signifies that they have died with Jesus. They've been united with Jesus in his death. And guess what? Does the person baptizing the person going under keep him under? No. That would be rude, right? <laughs> Sometimes if they're a really bad person, I just hold them under just like one second longer. Just kidding. I would never do that. It's terrible. But they go under the water, and that signifies them dying with Christ. But we don't leave them under the water. We raise them up. And when we raise them up, we've signified that they've raised something new. That when they were under the water, they died with Jesus on the cross. And when we raise them up, they began a brand new life in Christ. That's what baptism symbolizes. Baptism is actually a picture of what happens when we believe. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that brings us to the means of newness. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ. Now, this term actually, in Christ, is not just thing, a thing that Paul says here, but 25 times throughout the New Testament, Paul uses this phrase, in Christ. And it seems that if you begin to study that, that he's actually talking about something specific. You see, um, every time this is used, this phrase, in Christ, it's meant to draw you to this idea that people who follow Jesus, they're not just people who believe this cold set of doctrines or truths. We're not just intellectually agreeing to a bunch of doctrine, but... People who are in Christ are people who are enjoying intimate fellowship in relationship with their Savior, Jesus. A relationship with Jesus is the means of newness. In other words, this is how we pass from the old life to our new life. It is us being in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 gives us further insight into this phrase, in Christ, and what it means. I didn't put this on the slide. So if you want to follow it, you can turn to Galatians 3, 26 through 28. But here's what it says. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, Nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here Paul is speaking to the Christians in Galatia, and he's reminding them of their new identity. 
since they have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. To be baptized into Jesus Christ means that they have identified with Christ. Like we talked about the picture of water baptism. Having left their old sinful lives and they're now fully embracing their new life in Christ. When we respond to the Holy Spirit drawing, he baptizes us into the family of God. Now, don't get this confused. I know we're doing baptism this morning, and it's not the same baptism that it's talking about here. It's not referring to physical baptism, but simply what is happening spiritually when we completely give up our lives in order to follow Jesus. In fact, this idea, along with Jesus' command to be physically baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, is why we do baptisms in church. Because the person being baptized is acting out physically what already happened spiritually. That's why each one of the people being baptized can share these powerful stories and these testimonies that we've heard how Christ changed them. And so a relationship with Jesus is the means of newness, and this is how we become a new creation. Now, you might ask, are there any other ways? Can I become something completely new some way else? Right? People ask this question from time to time. Like, can I, can I take a pilgrimage to the east and sit under Hindu monks and become something new? Or maybe I can let go of all my wishes and all my desires and I can follow the way of the Buddha and be new. Or maybe I could drink hallucinogenic tea with Aaron Rodgers. Would that make me new, right? The answer is no. None of that can make you new, right? None of that can make you new. You can reinvent yourself all you want. You can even change your personality. You can rewire your brain with a hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic tea, right? You can do all of that, but none of that will actually change your spiritual condition. None of that will change who you really are because we are lost without Jesus. We are dead in our sins without Jesus. Acts 4.12 says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Being found in Christ is the only path to newness. All other roads are dead ends. And so let me encourage you. If you think this year you're going to get the new you by following some of these other paths to enlightenment, maybe it's I'm going to be a more healthy person or I'm going to be all of these other things, you know, you can change maybe who you are physically a little bit, but in order for you to have real newness, for you to be a new creation, for you to become something completely different, something that's glorifying God with your life, you must have Jesus. It's only found in him. That brings us to our last point, the promise of newness. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Whenever a person comes to be part of the body of Christ, there's a new act of creation on God's part. That's what Paul's trying to say here. And if you think about that, that's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? I mean, God already created us once. But when we come to know Jesus and we are in Christ, it's that we become new creatures. In fact, this is what Paul is emphasizing. He's trying to get us to understand that there's actually a discontinuity, don't you love that word? Discontinuity between our lives that we had before knowing Jesus and the lives that we have now in Jesus. He's saying there is a disconnect between these two things, that we actually become something new. We are completely different. We have gone from death to life. We have gone from slave to free. We've gone from completely under God's wrath to completely redeemed. Now, you might ask yourselves, well, that's great. Then why do I still struggle with sin? Right? Maybe that's the question that you have today. Why do I still struggle with sin in the desires of the world? I'm supposed to be this new creature in Christ. I'm supposed to be brand new and following Jesus, but I mess up all the time. I struggle with my faith. Welcome to being human, right? We all are in this same boat. And I totally feel that. I get that that's really hard to reconcile. But as I was thinking about this and as I was praying about this, I thought, you know, actually, that tension that you feel is actually a good thing. Not your sin, 
But the tension that you feel is a good thing. It means that you're continuing to long for something. That you're longing for the day where you'll be glorified before Jesus. You're longing and waiting and desiring the day for when you'll no longer be hindered by sin, but you'll freely love and serve God with everything that you are. It reminds me of another passage from Paul, one chapter earlier. Uh, one of the first passages of scripture I memorized, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, Paul views, his view of things is that there's a temporary reality that you and I live in right now. We live in a temporary reality, but there's actually an eternal reality that supersedes all of what's happening in our lives right now. And that temporary reality takes a back seat to our eternal reality. The fact that you still struggle in this world with, your, with the world, with your flesh and sin, doesn't take away from the fact that you actually have been transformed, that you have passed from death to life, that you are now a new creation in Christ. And that's how God sees you. You have been justified or made right by the blood of his son, Jesus. You are righteous before God because you are in Christ. And in the book of Romans, Paul makes it so clear that this truth, the truth that you've been given a new life in Jesus, should compel you towards something. That it should actually compel you to live a life in pursuit of Jesus in obedience to him. In other words, there's kind of two paths of information, or two paths that you can go in when you have this information. The first one is this. It's kind of to do what the flesh wants us to do. You could say, well, I've been given everything I need in Christ. When God looks at me, he sees me as righteous. And because I have this freedom, I'm a new creation, check mark, done. Right? I've, I'm going to use my freedom now to pursue whatever I want. Because I got that. It's in, it's in the bag. That's what our flesh wants us to do. Or you could say, look at what Jesus has provided for me. Look at the newness that he's given me. Look at the eternal reality that to God, I'm a brand new creation. Look at what Christ has done for me. Look at my eternal reality in Christ. One day, I will give up this failing body and I will follow Jesus in glory. And, and so starting now, let me live out to the best of my ability with God's help and grace, being this new creation that God created me to be. Let me grow over time in my obedience to Jesus through spiritual discipline and pursuing Christ. It's not just a future reality to look forward to. It's something to give ourselves in pursuit of Jesus right now. Paul is reminding us again and again that because of Jesus, we have done away with our former lives. And we should never look back. We should follow Jesus with everything we are. And another cool thing about this idea is you might say, well, okay, that's Paul, Paul's thoughts on it, whatever. Well, we, we know Paul is giving us this idea, but also we know other biblical authors talk about this as well. The apostle Peter gives us insight into this new creation and new life in Christ as well in his own words. He says this in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He's talking about the new life in Christ, and he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You really get this same sense of what we've already heard from Paul. There's this eternal reality and this eternal reality that we have, it supersedes what we're dealing with in the here and now. And Peter gives more insight, and he points out that it's through our faith, our trust in God, our faith in Jesus, that we're being shielded 
until we can realize this full inheritance that God is protecting himself in heaven. It's through our faith that we're being shielded. And so our faith in Christ is protecting our inheritance. And so that's motivation for us to nurture our faith even further. The more we pursue and grow our God-given faith, the more we live out our internal our eternal inheritance in Christ. Now, I started this message talking about resolutions. Did you know that only 9% of people follow their New Year's resolutions all the way to the end of the year? That's so depressing. Pastor Bill, why do you even say things like that on New Year's Day? Come on, right? And when scientists studied why, what they found was the prevailing reason that people didn't actually follow through is because when it really came down to it, they weren't actually willing to change who they were. They wanted the outcome of the resolution, but ultimately they were, willing, they were unwilling to change to get it. And here's what I want to tell you. Redemption tops resolution. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us to his glory and goodness. God has given you everything you need. You see, our reality is that we often fail to understand and embrace is that Jesus has already redeemed us. That he's already paid for us. That in Christ, that we actually do have access to everything we need to live the godly life that he's called us to live. Did you know that the power to change and be transformed is not out of reach for you? If you believe you won't change, that's a mental block to you changing. You have to believe that God has given you everything you need to live the godly life that he's called you to. In fact, you've already been transformed. The eternal reality is that you are a new creation in Christ. So many of us have given up on one part or another of our spiritual lives. We get lazy. I'll never conquer this sin. I'll I'll never get into this godly habit. I'll never be more patient. I'll never be a more forgiving person. Whatever it is for you, fill in the blank. And we think that certain spiritual aspects of our lives are out of reach for us. But they're not. They're not. God has given us everything we need in Christ Jesus for, for a godly life. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. The question is, in this new year, do you believe that? Will you embrace that? As you think about the year ahead, ask yourself, what would change if you really believed that God has given you everything you need for a godly life? What sin would you give up? What habit would you put into place? What area of your faith would you grow in? What would you put behind you and leave in 2022 if that were true? I want to end with this quote. Elizabeth Elliot said this. This, this year, let us dissolve all our hopes into a single hope to know Christ, and to be found in him. May this be the year to desire a radically transformed, deeper, truer, knowing Christ as our all-sufficient one. Will you pray with me? Lord, sometimes the biggest thing limiting us is ourselves. Yes, there's the temptation of the world, There's the environment, there's the flesh, there's all these other things. But sometimes, Lord, it's in our minds where we believe for some reason or another that we can't change, that we can't transform, that we can't be different, that we can't look more like Jesus, that this sin will always plague us, that we'll never build this habit, that we've failed too many times, that you've given up on on us, that you're somehow unfaithful to us, Lord. And I pray you would strike all of those thoughts from our minds today. That on the first day of the year, Lord, that we would look forward and we will say that I can do whatever God calls me to because of the power of being in Christ Jesus who conquered sin and death on the cross. 
and who rose again and showed us that new life is possible and that it's available to you and me. Lord, I pray that we would believe when you tell us that you can change us, that you can transform us. I pray, Lord, that this year we would be new in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.